Look, I think it's fantastic to have a packed room with uh, a topic of uh, formulae and precision, and I think that's largely in part to you, Warren, who've made this whole topic understandable and taught so many people the basic principles of what really is, I think we all begin to realise, one of the most important areas in our practice. Uh, disclosure, I'm a consultant for, uh, for Hoya, and I have licensed my formulae to uh, Hark Strite. So we do have formulae today that can accurately predict outcome for uh, different axial lengths, for uh, post-refractive surgery, but predicting toric lenses is probably the most challenging. And why? Because we're dealing with vectors, and vectors have both magnitude and they have axis. So the maths is inherently more complex. Now, the enigma is that despite having precise measurements, despite precise alignment, we still sometimes get surprises with toric lenses. And the talk is about trying to reduce those surprises. You need some terminology, and the first term I'd like you to think about is predicted residual astigmatism. This is what you predict to occur for your patient. It's simply the sum of the assumed or predicted toric cylinder power at the corneal plane plus the predicted corneal astigmatism from the measured K in the formula. It's that sum that helps you predict your residual astigmatism. And the error is simply then the difference between the post-op refraction and your predicted residual astigmatism. Now you can express that area in one of two ways. You can express it as a percentage of cases within a half diopter of predicted error, or a better terminology, which if you're not familiar with, you will become familiar with, is a centroid value. The centroid value of a group of vectors reflects both the cylinder power and the axis, and that's the correct term when discussing toric outcomes. And to display this information graphically, the other thing that you'll get used to is something called a double plot graph. And this is simply a graph where instead of being 360 degrees, it's 180 degrees. That's why it's a double plot graph. And if you plot the x and y values of that vector p, so p, um, the r is the magnitude, uh, alpha is the angle or your axis, if you plot the x and y values, you get a scattergram. And the middle of that scattergram is your centroid value. <clears throat> we really only began to understand keratometry with the introduction of the Javel Schiertz keratometer by uh, Louis Emile Javel in the 19th century. And when he began to use this instrument that he developed, he noted that when he measured the anterior radius, he couldn't completely explain the total ocular astigmatism. Something was missing. And back in the 19th century, he decided that this was actually due to the posterior cornea. And Javel's rule, over 100 years old, is that the posterior cornea contributes approximately a half diopter of against the rule of astigmatism. We kind of forgot that. And uh, Doug Koch reminded the, um, everyone of the importance of Javel's rule in his uh, Innovators Lecture in 2012. And he also, on a population base, showed that when you have increasing with the rule of astigmatism, you get increasing amounts of uh, posterior corneal astigmatism. But when you have increasing amounts of against the rule of astigmatism, you don't. It's pretty strange. The bottom line is this. If you ignore your posterior corneal astigmatism, with withdrawal patients, you'll overcorrect them on average by half a diopter. And with against the rule patients, you'll actually undercorrect them by about 0.3 diopters. That's on average. <clears throat> you can account for the posterior corneal astigmatism in one of two ways. You can use a uh, nomogram derived by Doug and Wee Lang called the Baylor nomogram. And, uh, or you can measure it using Scheinflug imagery, using a Pentacam or Galilei instrument. I'll introduce you today another approach. And uh, what I've done is firstly thought of a theoretical model 
would explain post-recording the stigmatism, the observed behavior. So it's taking our knowledge and looking for an explanation of why this cornea would behave in such a strange fashion. And the solution is quite simply is that the cornea has a unique architecture. And that is the horizontal diameter is always greater than the vertical. This means that the vertical radius is steeper than the horizontal radius. And therefore, this explains, the elliptical cornea explains a half diopter of against the rule astigmatism. So how can you predict it? Well, my RL calculation formula, the universal two, um, calculates a ciliary diameter. It actually inherently is different than other formula. It calculates a ciliary diameter. And I can use that formula to calculate a vertical radius and a horizontal radius. And this allows me to predict the posterior corneal astigmatism without actually measuring it. Now, there's many different uh, toric lenses available. Probably the uh, Alcon um, toric is the most commonly used. And when you try to compare calculation methods, there's some noise. And one of the noise factors is, is the lens exactly on your intended axis? Well, you can get rid of that noise by measuring the axis postoperatively. The surgical induced astigmatism is also noise. But you can get rid of that noise by measure using the post-op cornea keratometry. And uh, all that's left is the calculation method that you're using. And we did this. These are 68 patients from Antal uh, in Israel. And we use post-op corneal measurements. We use the measured axis of the lens in different methods of calculation. Now, whatever formula you use to predict the, the toric lens is all based on vector maths, poly to Cartesian mapping, but the formulas are different. So the Alcon calculator assumes a constant ratio in calculating what the toric cylinder power is at the corneal plane. So it ignores the fact that the lens is going to be sitting at different positions. It uses a constant ratio. We know that's not the case. If you look at the error in predicted outcome or predicted residual astigmatism with the Alcon calculator, the centroid is about 0.5 diopters of against the rule, and only about 33% of patients will be within a half diopter of predicted residual astigmatism. The holiday calculator does use a variable ratio. It takes into account the fact that the ELP changes in different patients, and it uses that calculated ELP in predicting your toric lens. Somewhat surprisingly, the uh, centroid with the holiday is very similar, about 0.55 diopters. The percentage of cases within a half diopter of predicted residual astigmatism is 35%, not that different. So my own calculator, as I've explained, uh, firstly uses the Barrett Universal 2 formula to predict the ELP, and uses that in the calculation, but it also predicts a posterior corneal astigmatism. And using this calculator, and this is on the same set of patients, the centroid is essentially zero, and now 72% of patients are within a half diopter. So this is not like Rick was suggesting just now, small incremental changes. This is a vast difference, 72% versus 35% of patients within a half diopter. It's not a small difference. Now, we've submitted this data. It's been accepted for publication and uh, hopefully will be published in JCRS uh, shortly. Now, subsequent to that study, I've concluded another study with my fellow Adi Abulafia where we not only measured post-operative Ks, but we also measured post-operative pentacam, posterior. We actually measured the radius of the posterior cornea. <clears throat> and we also looked at the prediction using the Baylor nomogram and also using posterior corneal actual measurements. And I want to thank Adi. He's not here uh, at this meeting, but he's been a great co-worker, researcher, and a lot of work's gone into these, uh, these studies. They're not simple studies to do. 
So let's look at the puzzle, and let's try and look at the different factors that contribute to that puzzle, that enigma of unknown toric outcomes. And as I said, you can look at pre versus post-op case. You can look at what role does SIA induced astigmatism play in unknown outcomes. You can look at your intended axis versus the measured axis and see what role does that play in your intended outcome. And you can look at different um, calculators. And this is what we did in this group of 54 patients who received toric IOLs. So there's essentially three scenarios. Scenario one, you use the calculators, but you use an assumed SIA. You don't know the SIA, you use pre-op case, and your intended axis alignments, assumed axis alignments. Scenario two, you can say, let's keep the axis alignment as assumed, but we'll put in the known SIA by using post-op case. And scenario three is when you know both the surgical induced astigmatism and you know the axis alignment, and all that's left is the calculation method. So if we look at scenario one, this is what typically you may do in your practice. You may um, only have an assumed axis, the intended axis of alignment. You may put in an assumed SIA. You may use a median value of 0.38. The first thing I'll show you is if you don't put in the median value for your SIA, but you use the centroid value for SIA, you'll improve your outcomes. So immediately, using a centroid SIA, which is about 0.1 diopters. So if you use a 2.4 millimeter incision, going to use my calculator, don't put 0.3 or 0.4, put 0.1 or 0.2, because I'm sure it will be similar to mine. That's for a temporal incision. And you can see that the centroid for my calculator here on these patients is once again, different set of patients, but close to zero. Let's now use the post-op case. So now I know the actual SIA. It's no longer an unknown factor. Uh, the axis is the intended axis, not the actual axis that I measure. And there's an immediate improvement. So I encourage all of you to use Warren's SIA calculator. Get to know what your SIA is. You can only do that if you operate on the same axis consistently. I would recommend that the temporal is a better axis because it's further away, less induced astigmatism. You can see the improvement. And this is a surprise that if now I enter not my intended axis of lens placement, but the measured axis of lens placement. So you know your SIA, you know where the lens is sitting, and there's only a small incremental improvement. So at least in my hands, it's not axis error which is causing unexpected outcomes. It's a small proportion. If we look at that double plot graph and you compare the Alcon to my own calculator, can you see the centroid, what it means? It's the center of that scatter plot on the double plot graph, close to zero as opposed to 0.5 diopters. Very similar to the earlier study that I showed you. But what's different here is we looked at the holiday calculator with the Baylor method, which had improved the percentage within a half diopter to 27%. Um, from to 50%. We also looked the holiday with pentacam measurements of the posterior radius. Not that great, still 35%, as opposed to 70.4% for my own calculator. It's a bit of a surprise, but if you measure the posterior radius, at least on the pentacam, use that in your calculations, you're not going to get as good a result as with my calculator. So, going back to our puzzle and trying to crack the code, the first thing is you will get an improvement by being more accurate with your SIA. There's a further improvement by being on axis of your toric lens, but as I said, it's quite modest. And the greatest factor of all that you can do today, anyway, is to use an improved calculator in reducing unexpected toric outcomes. I'm not saying that marking is not relevant. Of course it is. And there's many different ways you can mark your axis at surgery. You can use gravity markers. You can use spirit levels. Uh, Damon Gatinell has an imaging app where you can look for uh, details on the uh, limbal vessels. And Akahashi has this little inbuilt 
accelerometer. Uh, personally, I find trying to use these instruments a bit of a fiddle. Your, your other option, of course, um, is to get one of the new interoperative apparometers, um, pretty expensive, or the image-guided systems, such as the Varion or the um, Callisto from, from Zeiss. But I'll show you something a little bit different, and this is my own method of marking. And this is uh, somewhat new. I call it the TORICAM system, simple but accurate TORIC marking. You need three things. You need an iPhone and an iPhone app. And that, I'm pleased to say, is available on the Apple Store for free. You can download it. You need a macro lens because you need a magnified image. Uh, and if you speak to Hark Strike, they'll be able to help you with a macro lens. And you need a felt tip marking pen. Those are the three things you need. Let me explain the system. Here's an actual patient. So I dry the limbus first, and I use the felt tip pen directly on the limbus. To me, this is the best way to get a mark which doesn't you know, spread. And I estimate where I think 180 degrees is. I don't panic, because if it's not 180 degrees, I'll find out, because what my app does, as you see here, I um, look at the eye, support my phone with my hand, and can you see what I'm doing? I'm using the red reference axis, which is controlled by the accelerometer within my iPhone, to show me the actual degrees of my reference mark. So if I'm not 180, it will tell me exactly. There's a little button there which I'm pressing, and it's capturing that image, so I don't have to remember that number. And then I can go to my uh, photo album, camera roll, and uh, select, I may have taken two or three images, select the one which I think is best, and that gives me my reference axis in degrees. So patient name, when the photo was taken, what time, and the reference axis. So once you know your reference axis in degrees, the fudge has gone out of your, your marking. It takes about a minute to do. I set my marker to the toric lens axis, and if it's five degrees off, I'll put five degrees on my blue mark rather than zero. In this case, actually, we use the Varion. I've used the Varion in several cases with the app. I always get the same result. So the Varion and the app uh, coincide, except uh, the app is not sensitive to parallax, which some of these image-guided systems are. So if the eye rolls, you can fool the image-guiding system. And of course, when it then comes time to implant the lens, I have a reliable axis, as confirmed by the Varion, uh, to implant the lens. So I don't see much difference. I don't see any difference using something quite sophisticated or using the fairly, fairly simple um, Toricam app. There will be a special marker uh, which will be available um, specifically for the app. And quite simply, what this will do is allow you to set the Toric axis independently of the reference axis. Of course, you could do a mental calculation and offset your Toric axis. I, d I think that could be fraught with hazards. Better stick to what the um, uh, calculator tells you is the ROL axis. And for the reference axis, take that from the TORICAM app. So there's 23 consecutive cases using the app. And my mean error was actually quite small, only about 3.5 degrees. So what the app showed me, the actual reference axis was to what I thought it was. But look, even then, there are some cases up to 7 degrees. Unless you use something like this, you won't know what it is. And now I know exactly what my reference axis is. So, Toric Enigma cracking the code. In summary, um, as we discussed, SIA is important. Keep your incision small, keep it on one location, use Warren's calculator to find out how much it is. Uh, axis, be as accurate as you can. And here's a solution which I think is appropriate to the size of the problem, because it's not the major factor. And of course, consider using an improved calculator. So thank you for your attention. So we have just a few minutes for, for some questions. First, I'd, I'd like to make a couple comments. And, and that is that Graham's calculator has been something of an epiphany for those of us who use the Toric IOL a lot. 
In fact, when the leadership of the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery saw how good his calculator was, this is one of the newest additions to our website, and this is what I use as well. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy that this is going to be added to the LensStar as a very important piece of software. So Graham, let's, let's start with you. Any, any questions for Dr. Barrett about um, the TOR calculation process? Any questions about centroid calculation, perhaps? <laughs> Just in the back there. Just a quick question. What is your primary uh, instrument of choice to determine the accuracy of the measurement? For marking? Yeah, for, 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 for actual marking. He's talking about the steep meridian pre-op. Yeah. To find it out, look, I do three things. Um, I use, say, a lens star or biometer or, or hour master. I use a Javal. A manual keratometer with a good observer and topography. I use uh, Pentacam. And it's doing exactly what Warren says. I'm looking at those three and confirming that my biometer is giving me the right axis because unless you do, uh, maybe you can get away with two, or maybe lens star topography may be enough, but at the moment I'm using three to confirm I've got the right uh, axis here. The hour master in particular will sometimes give you spurious readings. Not often, but occasionally, it'll be quite misleading. Uh, now, if you are using four parameters to determine your axis, that means you're using Pentacam along with your AutoRef and uh, uh, the, 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 the Tori calculations with the lens star. Uh, mm -hmm. And all the four readings are different. Yes along with the topography, like you said. Now, which one would you most rely on still? Sure. That is still an enigma. Look, it doesn't happen often, but occasionally you'll get three which don't match. That's the only time I then look at the refraction at the patient's old glasses. And uh, if they've been wearing glasses for four years, and I see, gosh, it's one doctor at a certain axis, and it tends to match one of my groups then that helps influence me. But if you get all three that don't match, I'll repeat them. And um, usually I can get some coincidence. If the worst comes to the worst, I repeat it, they still don't match, I'll take the average of the most likely two. But it's unusual. If, they don't, if all three don't match, something's not right. You've got some irregular astigmatism, a dry eye, send the patient away on lubricants, come back in two weeks and do it again. Topography becomes the gold standard, or is it the lens star would be the gold standard if there's a confusion? Look, I think the lens star is the most accurate instrument uh, there is, but I think um, for the axis, as Warren said, that really helps you on that parameter. So, um, and the axis will tell you if, it's, if it is irregular and will tell you that, gosh, be very circumspect at using anything else for the axis, and sometimes you may choose not to put a toric lens in if you can't identify where the axis should be. And this is one reason why it's such a good idea to start with a topographic axial map, because you get three pieces of information. Is the astigmatism regular? Is it symmetrical? Regular means are the lobes along the same meridian. Is it symmetrical? Do you have no lobe here and a huge lobe down below? And then what is your best approximation of the steep meridian? And then going forward from that, you can validate the other pieces of information. And when we use things like the Pentacam, we would look mostly at the axial power map rather than the simulated case. The simulated case for the Pentacam can be quite variable because of issues with registration. It takes two seconds for that shine fluid camera to rotate 360 degrees. We had one quick question over here. That's correct. Uh, how does the Barry calculator individual calculate uh, compared to Olsen and Audi? Do you have a case study? Well, actually, I, I did that study, and I presented that at ASCRS in the Innovators Lecture last year. The Barrett Universal 2 formula is the most accurate theoretical formula we currently have in 2014, followed by Olsen, followed by Holiday 2. So right now, Graham Barrett's calculator wins the prize. Your, your question, sir. 